All right, so I'm going to give the least technical talk of today. So turn your brains off for a little bit. <laughs> that, that happened at midnight last night. <laughs> okay, from hacker to professional. This is something that um, I felt very strongly about for a long period of time. And I was listening to Ben Rev one day, and Stank kind of went off on a... Uh, <laughs> kind of went off on a tangent about certifications and how people in InfoSec didn't know what they were doing. And being in InfoSec, I, I agreed with him. I, I completely agreed with everything he had to say. So here's what we have. There's problems with information security. We all know it. One of the biggest is the managers. I, I'm talking about managers forever. Um, executives and vendors. These are the three big areas that cause problems. And there's various reasons why they cause these problems. So let's start with the managers. I've had my share of bad InfoSec managers. Now, currently being an information security manager, <laughs> I hope I don't fall into that category. But um, a lot of times what we find is that these guys have an alphabet suit. How many people in here have a CISSP? How about a CEH? How about MCSE? I mean, these are all certifications that when you're looking at an information security manager, they've got a ton of these things behind their names. There are CISSP, CEH, um, GSEC, Certified Idiot. I mean, they, they've learned how to pass tests, but they have no practical knowledge behind it. They've never sat down and really thought about the design of their networks or the design of a network in general and how to secure it. That's a problem. These guys are hired off what's behind their name, and they make tons of money off what's behind their name. So this is the first big problem. <laughs> this is the next one. This is, this is actually where it causes us problems. If a lot of these managers, if you show you know more than they do, um, they get a little bit scared. They get a little bit nervous. You walk in with a... Uh, copy of 2600 in your hand, they're freak out. This guy's going to hack my network. Oh my God, run. You're in a meeting and they start talking about some idiot design that they're going to do with the network next year and you're like, well, that's bad. You don't want to do that. You'll get ignored. They're scared. They don't want to lose that big fat budget that they have. Right now, information security is a huge buzzword. You see it everywhere. It's on CNN, it's on Fox. You open up any trade magazine and it's the topic of conversation is InfoSec. But that leads to people that, are, that, that will join inf the information security teams that don't know what they're doing. They're here not because they love technology. They're here not because they're interested in security. They're here because it's a buzzword. It's a way to move up a corporate ladder and get recognition. And in the end, that's not what it's about. I mean, most of us join information security because we like what we do. That's the reason, we, that's the reason we're here. That's the reason we, we go to work, a lot of us, every day, is because we actually like what we do. Now, some of the managers that fall under this category here, they don't. They get up every day because they can go schmooze with the executives sit and go on big fat golfing trips and have big budgets and get big bonuses. Um, that is not, by the way, is there any manager, InfoSec managers here? Oh, good, because I'm going to really piss you guys off a little bit later. <laughs> All right. When you, when you start talking about information security managers or start talking to them, most of them start talking about mitigating factors. Mitigating controls. We're going to put this mitigating control in for this vulnerability, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and, and this is the mitigation we're going to use, and they really have no idea of what, I'm sorry? Mitigate, uh, it's, uh, for instance, if, if there's a vulnerability on port 139, and you put a firewall up that blocks port 139 from the Internet, that's a mitigating control. You've just intercepted that vulnerability and cut it off. But there, there's, what, what's that? <laughs> okay, they're going to put a fucking firewall in between it. <laughs> to them, that is the most mitigation that they need or, or that they care about. 
um, they would they don't understand that, that things go deeper. Um, how many people know? How many people agree with Microsoft's one month patch cycle? Well, see, here here's the thing. Microsoft puts out these patches once a month, and they label the vulnerabilities critical, low, so so forth, right? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. You do. Uh, Microsoft, but but what happens is when these managers get these vulnerability or get these patches from Microsoft, is they only concentrate on the most critical because we all know if you apply a bunch of Microsoft patches at one time, it can kill your application that you're trying to run. And that's not fun to explain to a CIO. Uh, our database is down because we patched the security flaw? No. <laughs> well, that, you're exactly correct. You're, you're exactly right. But that causes vulnerabilities to be left um, untouched because the, the lows get ignored or get pushed out to a quarterly cycle. In most companies, you, when Microsoft releases a patch, you, meet, you go into QA, and you start testing this, these patches with your applications. Well, there's usually so many that you can't get them all tested and all the bugs worked out before the next one comes. So you start chopping off the bottom. Well, a lot of the managers don't understand that some of those bottom ones can lead to your biggest exploits. They don't understand that that's still an attack vector into their network. If it's not critical, they don't, they don't patch it. They, they'll, it'll go unpatched for you. I worked at a company that had never applied in the last six months, had never applied a low severity patch, ever. No. Um, actually, if I told you who they, her, who they were, you would really get a kick out of it. <laughs> I've, I've been there too. Um, so these guys, they really don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand that they need to look at a network holistically. They need to look at an attack path from every angle. It's not just coming from the Internet. It's coming from the inside too. In fact, I'm not worried about you guys on the Internet. I'm more worried about the jerk down in the mailroom who is making five bucks an hour. And uh, he wants a new Porsche. Uh, that's the guy I'm more worried about because that's the guy that's going to cause identity theft. That's the guy that's really going to be a pain in the rear end. Now, executives. I can't lay all the blame on the managers. Well, yeah, I can. I'll try. Um, executives hold a big part of this as well. <clears throat> what can you say about these guys? Most of these guys are... are most executives are bright to a point. They understand business. Well, being an InfoSec, you must also understand business because that's what you're there for, your business enabling. But what these guys don't understand is how we do our job. They're more about bragging. I have just last month, I, went on a, I was forced to go on a golf outing with an executive. And all he did was brag, well, we spent... $30 million in the past two years on this security and this security, and we've got this in place, and we've bought this, and, you know, ISS is the greatest company in the world, and Cisco rocks, and... Yeah, yeah. See, but, see, it's all about bragging. It's how much their company has done. You ask them how this stuff is deployed, they go, uh, uh, on the network somewhere. They don't understand. They don't get it. Now, this is something that I've dealt with at every company that I've been at, and that's hiding of security flaws. And when I say hiding of security flaws, I'm not talking about from the general public. I'm talking about a company, an executive, hiding a security flaw from themselves. It, a CIO walking into a CEO's office and going, we're secure. When he just 10 minutes later walked out, or 10 minutes before, walked out of a meeting where he was advised of credit card numbers be, being sent in clear text over the Internet or Social Security numbers being distributed throughout the company to 30 different people for every employee hired. But we're secure. We're not in violation of anything. 
This happens more than we would like to know. It happens a lot more than we would even want to admit. It scared me the first time I was told to shut up and don't talk about a security flaw. There's a problem on our network. Don't talk about it. We're not going to fix it yet. You're not allowed to touch it, and you better not speak about it. This happened to me at my very first information security job. And that was at a Tier 1 financial institute who I guarantee at least three-quarters of the people in this room have credit cards that are processed by. Now, if that doesn't bother you, then there's, there's something wrong. I mean, I started, I was told to find, a, to find an attack vector. They wanted me to find an attack vector on the network to where I could gather information to prove a database was insecure. I opened up a packet sniffer. Not even EtherCAP, just EtherReal. I was on, not even sniffing past the switch and caught 20. That's... <laughs> These are the things we run into, and, and they are hidden. They're not talked about inside the company. Now, here's the other one. How many people go to um, PC World for their information security news? <laughs> you <laughs> was executives, given that they're so focused on business, they wind up listening to the wrong sources about security. Who do they listen to? Do they ever turn on BinRef? Do they ever... <laughs> Do they ever show up at Freaknet? Do they ever show up at DEF CON? Yes, they are. Or oh, they need to be. <laughs> really? You're lucky. Right. Right. You're ex you and I are in a rare case because... My executive was extremely ecstatic. I was going to even show up. Yes. Do you want to be honest? How, what I do, I did to my um, CIO. I set him up with an RSS feed to root secure. That was enough to get his eyes open. Um, He, he is, and, and, and he has a way, and even his new Security Now podcast he does with Leo Laporte, um, he, uh, he, he's a great talker to executives. And an executive will listen to him and understand what's being said. And that, you're, you're right, that's a great source. But not right off the top of my head. I think, personally, I think that we should be, the, the executives should be coming to us and not an external news source. Because even as great as, as Bruce is or, or Root Secure is or whatever, they don't know. What, uh, what's that? Exactly. So it's better if they just come to us first and we can sit down and talk about it. Because they, they really want to understand what they're reading or listening to for the most part. They'll get the high level. Oh, yeah, that's bad. But why is it bad? Exactly. Quantitative and qualitative values to security risk needs to be applied. Now, that's business terms as well, but in InfoSec, again, we're business enabling. You're right. We need to put dollar figures and asset values on everything, and they can understand what this attack could cost them, not only in real money, but in public reputation. So we should be the number one source, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> now, vendors... All right. Yes. Oh. <laughs> right. Um, you're exactly right. Buzzword compliancy. The, I, I should have covered that back in managers. All managers are buzzword compliant. All of them. Guilty. Um, it. it Sometimes you can get executives to leave you alone by talking about um, IPSEC. They'll just go, okay, I'm going this way. <laughs> I don't know what this guy's talking about. SSL VPN already. <laughs> um, now, vendors. I take it easy on vendors, even though I shouldn't. Vendors, they're not really to blame. Well, that's not true. They are. Um, I was working at a very large tier one financial institute and the information security manager 
by a certain vendor, got everyone in his family had an iPod purchased for them plus a digital camera um, by a vendor. Guess who got the contract for our IDS? Inferior product, didn't fit all of our needs. Who got the contract? <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> um, I mean, it, but that's business. Vendors, while they may say, and some do, truly care about security of your network, they're designed to make money first. That's what they're there for. We're in a capitalist society. In capitalist societies, we make money. Businesses are not there to be this, they're not there to give things away. They're not there to do great things for you for nothing. They're there to make money. So while we don't like some of their tactics, while we think that, eh, that was kind of sleazy of a three-letter company buying all this stuff for the manager, which I was upset because I didn't get anything, um, <laughs> it, it's just the way business works. And unfortunately, that's what we have to deal with. How can we overcome that? What would be the number one way to overcome a situation like that? Well, it's real hard, but education. <laughs> Get that one passed. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Get that one signed off by the CIO. Right. That will never happen. I've tried. It won't happen. Exactly. Consultants never say, get rid of the consultant. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, some, some vendors, and I'm not going to name them even though I should, they do a really good job. I've had really good experiences with some vendors. In areas where I lack knowledge, I was able to call on a vendor, even though I hadn't purchased their product, and get information, get design work done. Even though I went, went the other way. This happened with a great um, vendor who was recently purchased by a large firewall manufacturer. They, they helped me in ways that they shouldn't have. So they did a really good job. And some vendors will do that, but you've got to think, they also had an al alternative motive there. They wanted to one day be my IDS vendor. So, but they did do a good job. <clears throat> so who... What's left? Who determines um, the proper usage of equipment and the placement of equipment or the placement of security measures? Well, it's up to us. We must do it. If you're in information security or you're planned to be in information security, that needs to be one of your top priorities. If you leave it up to a vendor, they'll make recommendations, but sometimes they're not correct for your environment. It's easy to sit here and take a network diagram, draw it up, throw controls into place and say, this will secure your network. No, maybe not. Maybe you're missing something. Most, most vendors are, do, not, are, do not have full access or should not have full access to what our network looks like, the type of business we conduct, and so forth. So we shouldn't ignore their recommendations outright. We should always look at them. But we should always take what they say and put it into our design and, and use that to build our network because... Once you're in the field, you have a lot less time to spend in the field. You don't get as much time to do research because you're always working on your own network at work. That's where the 20-hour days come in. <clears throat> All right, design. A buddy of mine um, wrote a paper called Jousting from Unicycles. Now, he wrote this for one of those certifications that we all don't like, um, for his SANS GSEC certifications. Now... This didn't get honors, but it really hit home to me and I think anybody else that has read it. Um, his name is Daniel Meisler. Um, and in Jousting from Unicycles, he talked about addressing design rather than adding armor. And he was speaking about code. Fixing our code is the greatest, the flawed code that's out there is the greatest path to security. If the code has no vulnerabilities, it's much harder to exploit. Then it really gets down to process and social engineering. So you're taking out a big component if you fix the code. Well, 
after we started talking, he goes, you know, jousting from unicycles also applies to everything. Everything that we do. We have a tendency to start throwing money at problems. We're in America. We've got lots of it. We throw it at problems. Make them go away. Sometimes it's not that easy. So if you take a knight and you put him on a unicycle and throw 300 pounds of armor on him and don't design that properly, what's going to happen to him? He's going to fall on his ass. But if we take the proper time and design things correctly, he can joust from a unicycle. In fact, he'll, we'll probably throw a second wheel on there for him or two more and help him out in his jousting. So design is a, is a very key component to security, and especially when we talk about moving from hacker to professional. And I'll get into exactly what that means in just a second. Okay, flaws in design. We, we are, Everybody in this room should agree with this. Flaws in design, whether it's code, um, firewall placement, mitigation measures, these are all of our biggest problems when it comes to security. It's not, it's not necessarily that Microsoft builds crap products, which they do, but it's, the reason they do is flaws in their code. It's, they're not able to keep tight controls and do checking on variables and things that they should do because of the way they manage things. Their design is bad. So we have to fix design. And I just screwed up my slide. That's great. All right. All right, that's the end. No, I'm just kidding. All right. All right, <clears throat> so design is far more important than the money that we spend. Instead of throwing money at problems, let's put design, let's design security solutions to where we don't have to spend money. How about that for a change? Let's save money. Um, during some penetration testing and so forth, um, several people have mentioned that do pen testing for a living that they'll walk into a Fortune 100 company start scanning around, exploit a couple of boxes, get domain admin account, and nobody knocks on the door. Nobody notices. Why? They spent millions on security. They should know, right? But then you go down to some podunk college, they've got no budget. All their budget is taken up in the one guy's $25,000 a year salary. And... Uh, you walk in there and fire up NMAP and 15 people walk in, walk, go, what are you doing? Did you just use NMAP in my network? Why? Well, the reason is because is they have no budget. They've had to get created. They've had to design. A lot of these guys spend a whole bunch of time writing their own software. Simple shell scripts, Perl scripts, Python. You can do a lot with tools that are already there. Tying NMAP to Python or Perl and doing a scan of your network tell you, will tell you when somebody else, when somebody new connects. So, I mean, a lot can be done with very little when we try. And that's what we need to do. Um, you know, is, is a manager going to try this? Is an executive going to try this? No. It, it, they should. This is how they should think because it saves their company. And it does far better than... Um, just going and spending $100,000 on a new IDS sensor. <clears throat> all, right, all the technology in the world cannot buy security. That's been proven time and time again. We ha again, as we throw money at things, we also throw technology at it. Does it fix it? Is the United States any more secure on this year's audit than we were last year? Not really. Why are other countries so much better at us than security. They don't throw money at the problem. They don't have it to throw. They throw design. They, de they fix the problems through mitigation, proper mitigation measures that they can write themselves, that they can implement themselves. Here's, a, here's another little tip for you. Which one's less likely to break or have issues? It'd probably be the script that you wrote. So throwing technology at a problem does not make it go away, will not make a network more secure. It can help if done right. But if you just throw money at it and technology, it's not going away. 
so who can make the changes? Who can, who can make things better? Well, it's us. Um, I thought that at one time, I thought that everybody that I talked to that was interested in security and exploits wanted to be in information security. That was, the, that was where everybody wanted to be. I was wrong. And I, now I know why I, I was wrong. Um, how many people think that the information security industry is kind of crooked and dirty? Think, oh, well, knows it is, thinks it is. Well, I was right there with you guys. In fact, um, said manager that got <laughs> lots of uh, gifts for going with an IDS solution, after I confronted him about some bad decisions he made, asked me if I thought he was technically competent and a good manager. I answered honestly, guess who didn't have a job in a couple of weeks? The reason was is he, he, he didn't care, but I was wrong. I, went at, I approached it wrong. So we can make the changes if we do things right, but we have to make slight changes in us first if we're going into information security. Now, uh, this one's kind of hard because everybody goes, well, you want me to sell out. Well, no, I don't. I want you to, my, in a perfect world, I would have a whole bunch of geeks working, in, working with me in information security that knew how to play the game without playing the game. They would, you're getting into the corporate culture, but you're not losing yourself. You're not, you're not going out and buying a Ferrari or a Porsche you're, you're, staying, you're, you're staying current with technology. You keep learning. You keep pushing yourself to the limit. You're playing the game but not becoming a corporate sellout. It's bad to say because at times I feel like I've done it. But I still try real hard to force back to what got me in here to begin with. Now, <laughs> this is the hard part. You've got to move up the ladder. It's not enough to get the InfoSec job. And you can great, make great money and have a great long-lasting career just working in infra, information security. But our goal here is to change things, right? We want to make things better. I mean, whatever that means to you, you still want to make things better. So we have to do that. We have to move up the ladder. A level one InfoSec engineer is not going to have near the influence that a level two does, or even a senior, or a manager, or a CIO. The problem is we have a lot of people that go into information security and never get to those levels because they get fed up and, they don't, and they're not willing to change enough to get there. Now what, <clears throat> and the, fact, the sad fact is that we can't make any changes unless we get there. And once we get there, we can see how we can make things a lot better. And once we're in the right places, we need to start affecting changes. How do we do that? Well, there's, there's several ways to go about it. One is if you can be the lone voice about doing things correctly in your network and you're at a high enough level, a level two or above, people will start listening. And you know those nasty letters behind your name that none of us really care about? You'd be surprised if you throw enough of those behind your name how many people who would ignore you before will now sit up and pay attention? We know they're worthless. They don't. I mean, CISSP, I'm a CISSP. CISSP is an inch deep and a mile wide. I know a lot about every, I mean, a little about everything. So, and that's what that test covers. I can teach a monkey to pass that test. They have. <laughs> but, <laughs> so the, the way to change this is to get, even though it, it, it makes you feel bad because they're useless, if you get, them by, get those letters behind your name, sometimes you can get that executive to listen to you because all you have to do is simply send them an email that says CISSP at the end or GSEC at the end. They're like, oh, I better not mess with this guy. He's awesome. What? Sometimes that works, actually. <laughs> Because <laughs> they don't understand anyway. You put A, B, C, D, F, G, A, they don't care. But 
yet, once you get into the position, you can start effective changes. You can do that. The easiest way to start that process is with policy. How many people have written information security policies or read them? How many people think they will put you to sleep quickly? Yeah, they, they, yeah, <laughs> they stink. Mine stink. I mean, mine are boring, full of legal terms and garbage. But you'd be surprised how one single sheet of paper will make changes happen in your network. I sat down one day and wrote a policy for a large um, company that has the backbone for a lot of web demonstration stuff um, that changed the way that they did um, security on their Linux boxes, brought them out of the Stone Age with one sheet of paper. It made an impact. I felt good about myself. I didn't buy products. I wrote a policy. I sat down and thought about the way we did business, thought about what was wrong. I wrote a policy and I fixed it, which that one change, two months later, probably saved us three and a half million, I would have guessed, because we got audited by uh, Visa and they didn't like it. They wouldn't have liked what they would have seen if, if I wouldn't have written that policy and made the change. So we'd have lost lots of money. All right, so I put the about me at the end, and my name is Kenneth Swain. I am an information security manager at the 12th largest power company in the United States. And if you want to reach me, you can reach me at Ken at KenSwain.com. Anybody have any questions? What now? I could tell you, but then I would have to get fired. <laughs> I really don't like that. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, the correct way is actually very hard to define when it comes to a business because it changes. Every company does business in a slightly different way, so the correct way at one company is the incorrect way at another. So the key part to doing things the correct way is understanding technology, understanding how, biz how your current business works, and how to, make it, how, to, how to implement security without disrupting that business. That's the correct way. Um, now, that doesn't mean throw everything at the perimeter, have a big armor on the outside, and be all gushy inside. You have to address everything. You have to look at the inside going out. But <clears throat> um, the correct way is always what is best for the business. It's just not, that's the easiest way to define it. And, and the only way that you can get there is for you to do, do the research and, about your company, learn the technology, and then figure out what's the best way to implement it there. Yes? Okay, cool. I'm glad somebody's asking questions. The first thing I would do, the first, first piece of advice I'd give them is spend about double the time they normally would in design. Put it in, on paper. Um, that, is the, that is the biggest key factor to securing a network. Um, that would be the first measure. And then you would have to go from there, depending on the business you were doing. Of course, you're going to do all the normal things. You want an IDS system. You want intrusion detect. I mean, uh, possibly intrusion prevention. You could. We could start throwing some more buzzwords like HIDs and HIPs and and you know. You know, you're going to want firewalls. But the biggest thing to start off with is is that design. That core design will take you further than anything else. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, I'm married to a geek, and that helps because she understands when I go lock myself in a bedroom or office for 
all night and don't come to bed and then get up and go to work the next morning. She understands that. I, I, I just I do it the brute force method. I mean, uh, I am the biggest user of bandwidth on my network right now, besides the guys I just kicked off for doing P2P. But besides those guys, I was the biggest user. I was the biggest user of bandwidth, and all of mine is RSS feeds, podcasts, any place that I can get information. I do. If I'm sitting at a restaurant and I've just went and bought a copy of 2600 and I'm waiting for my meal to come, I'm reading it. If there's a book that comes out that I want, I'm reading it. And I will find little pieces of time to help myself stay on top. That's the only way that I know of right now. And use the tools that are out there to help you. I mean, podcasts are great. I, I wish there was more security podcasts. Um, that's one of the ways to help you stay on top of things. I mean, I listen. I don't listen to radio anymore. I have satellite radio, and I don't even listen to it. I listen to podcasts on the way to work in the morning. So. Yes. Uh, mhm. For most people, the easiest track to do that is to shut up and listen. Um, as hard as it is to listen in those meetings at times, I fell asleep in a couple. Um, listen to the way they speak. My wife will tell you I'm a natural-born BSer. I'm, I'm, I was a Microsoft trainer. So I learned, <laughs> I learned how to stand up in front of people and, and, and talk at a young age. Um, my, my dad was a salesperson. I, I learned very early how to stand up in front of people and talk. And even though this is the most nervous I've ever been in my life, I, I still am less nervous than in a lot of other situations. You just have to listen to how people talk. And, and even if it means picking up a, a, a legal book every now and then to find out how to convey something, that you have to do those things. I mean, the, the biggest thing, though, is just shut up and listen to them. Uh, because different companies convey things differently. So, all right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Sans.org has is got a great resource for that. Um, there's not a lot. Everybody wants to charge you a lot of money for them, for what's out there. And and I don't think it's right to charge me money to write a security policy. But the general format on SANS, and I, what I did was I took SANS format, read a couple of their policies, and figured out how they were trying to convey it. Then I made my own template, and I just used that blank template to fill in what I'm trying to do. And for every policy that I write, for every page, I figure I spend about eight hours of research and, and thinking of hard about the policy before I ever put it on paper. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I haven't read that. I'll, I'll have to pick that up. Um, the Linux, in, uh, Linux Administrator's Handbook? Yeah, Linux Sysadmin's Handbook. Um, yeah, you know what? I wish I was an author because somebody needs to write a book about policy, cover information security policy and design. We have a lot of books out there that cover various aspects, but we don't have anything that covers it as a whole. We have no good resources to go and pull off a bookshelf and say, this is how we need to do it. That is the other part, yes, but you would think that there would be big money in it because I'd buy a copy. I'd make everybody read it. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry? What, what do I... I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh -huh. That's always good. A, a, what do I look for? Um, I'm not a, I've only done a few external audits, so I'm not really good to speak about that. But what I look for when I went in and what I look for when I go to a new company is look at
doing now, and generally they are so comfortable, you can always think of a way that you can get around what measures they have in place. Um, most, again, most companies are really good about patching the critical flaws, but they're horrible about missing the medium and low level stuff. So you, generally, I start at the low-level stuff, stuff that would slip under their radar, that they would ignore. That's where I start. Yes, sir? What now? If you've got that much time, I mean, it's really hard. Doing a full audit, especially at the price tags that, that people charge for that, nobody's going to pay for you to do a full audit. You're, you're generally, they, they want to know, the last one I did, which was the biggest one I did, I was told, find 20 flaws. You hit 20, stop. Week, I was done. I found 20 major things. And what it was was low-level and medium-level stuff that they just slipped under their radar that led to a complete, me having domain admin privileges on their network. You know, small things can lead to big ones. Small paths can lead to big things. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'll I'll tell you a story um, at a at a company that uses a mainframe, um, limited to eight-character passwords. Now, they don't, do not see a reason why their email should have lo larger than eight-character passwords, even though it's tied to Active Directory. They don't understand why they should use longer than eight characters. Hey, it's good enough for the mainframe. My pin number is only four characters long. That's good enough, so I should only need a four-character password. So I, I feel your pain, and the only thing that I know how to do is sell it to them. Yeah. And it, that is the only way that I have found, and maybe somebody else, anybody else have any other ideas, is I just present it to them on a, in a real-world situation that they might understand. Instead of saying, well, you need to do it because there's, you know, rainbow tables and rainbow crack that can really crack that password, blah, 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 that, <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. And, and let's ask ourselves why. Why do they not understand that? It's never happened. They don't, most people are good people by nature, correct? I mean, I, most everybody's good-hearted by nature. So why would anybody ever walk into a building they're not supposed to go to, sit down to an open computer terminal, and start pulling information? That would be wrong. So they're not going to do it. Oh, that's great. That's <laughs> awesome. Love that. And the worst part is you go in and talk to them for a second, and then, you know, you can't help but notice that and say that. And then they change it, and then, you know, and then you come back and they change it, and you're like, oh, we don't get to change A lot of times... And I, I didn't cover this, but I think it's worth mentioning. Education is the second biggest way to security. After design, it's education. People, by nature, don't want bad things to happen to the people that pay their bills, their companies. So if they're educated to start thinking defensively, they will eventually if they're capable. And if enough people start doing it, you have a much easier job. So... Educating as to why they, which sounds like something that you did, is just just talking to them, educating them, telling them why they shouldn't, and explaining it in language that they understand. Bob down at the car lot is not going to understand the same thing that, you know, somebody at a technical company might. Oh, great. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah.
And the reason is, is because with some of the patches and some of these homebrewed apps that, that are out there, you're, sometimes you feel almost forced. Either I patch the flaw that I know we're vulnerable for and take the risk. Even if I put it in the QA cycle, I may not get done with it for the next series of patches come out. And then what am I? I'm, then I'm two months behind. Well, you, that, that's true, but, I, but the ones that are, that is a problem that I run into every single day. I, I work in the information security department, and I've tried to, to work very, very closely with our development group and our, and our networking group to try to get a team effort together for security. Um, it's very difficult at times. But I have to push constantly for testing of patches. Constantly. Hey, guys, did you run this through our test bed yet? No. Did you run it through anything yet? Well, I'm thinking about it. Guys, come on. You've got to move faster. You've got to spend the time on this. And sometimes it's lack of resources. For instance, they may be doing something else right now. They may not have the time. It's either, okay, I can do this one thing that I've got to get done, and I know I've got to get patching done, but I don't have the time to do both right now. Or maybe they don't. You're exactly right. There's a lot of problems. How do you test? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, th those are all things to consider. There's, there's time, there's money, there's resources. I mean, again, you, you may not have the, the proper resources to do it. I would love, if I could add five people to my staff, I could increase our security on our network tenfold. If I could add five people. But the money's so tight, I can't add five people. How much would you say when we add, say, two? If I could add two more people, I could probably at least get double the security. I, the reason I need five is I need some people dedicated to testing. I need three people dedicated full-time to keeping up with our mainframe patch testing, our... our custom in-house app patch testing, and uh, Windows. I need people dedicated to constantly testing these patches. Better be information security. That's your job. Um, information security not only covers stopping hackers, but it covers making sure that business is able to function. Now, I mentioned CISSP earlier and mentioned that I'm one. One of the greatest things that I didn't realize until I sat down and read the book, the ISC squared rec puts your list of priorities or the list of priorities for all CISSP should be human life, your business, then yourself in that order. Well, but yeah, you're, an information security officer should be very aware of all physical threats to everybody in that building and should take active measures and be involved with physical security to, to make sure that nothing happens to human life. Then if there is going to be a problem, make sure that you get the human life out of that building, then the data resources that you can. So yes, information security should be very involved with DR and business continuity planning, always. Okay. Anybody got any more questions real quick? All right, thank you guys for your time.